Good morning, Echo Voice participants. I'm so sorry that I can't be joining you live today, but thank you for taking the time to sit with me during this pre-recorded video as we discuss the idea of consent as an essential communication skill. For those of us that work supporting students with multiple disabilities or complex communication needs, students that may not have the bodily autonomy, consent is a necessary skill for both their safety and their well-being. My goal of this presentation today is to give you the framework you need to teach your students to advocate for their boundaries and also reflect on your role in your practice in helping to protect those same boundaries. A little bit of background for you. My name is Sarah Weber and I am a speech language pathologist working in the state of Illinois. I have been practicing in pediatrics for the past nine years. I've worked in both clinical and educational settings. Um, I'm currently employed in a private therapeutic program. We take students that have been placed out of their home district due to the intensity of their needs, um, and then they come to us in our program. It's a K through 22 program, again, specializing in all sorts of students with unique and challenging needs. Um, as you can tell, I obviously I love that setting because it gives me a chance to work with and support both my students and their families in a really student centered focus. That is the the beauty of where I am, and that's really what I do believe in the model that I base all of my therapeutic practices on. Um, I do have a couple of financial disclosures for you. I am the owner of Speech and Cards LLC. That helps provide private therapy services in the state of Illinois, as well as parent and clinician coaching throughout the United States. I also do sell therapy resources that you can purchase digitally or physically. And I have an Etsy shop that features designs, including encouragement and advocacy for inclusion. All right, so what you can expect from this training today, we are going to go through the background information. We're going to talk about consent, why it's essential, and define some of the terms that I'm going to be working through today. Once we've gotten through the background, we're going to go into some practice examples that we'll work through together. And then we'll get to the case study at the end where you get a chance to go through and apply some of the frameworks that I've talked about using your own thoughts and observations. Um, I do have three learning objectives by the end of today's presentation. I hope that you are able to both define consent, self-advocacy, and personal boundaries. And I'm going to give you the chance to analyze opportunities to gain a student's consent during your typical classroom or service-based activities, um, and then to describe the importance of deliberate practice when teaching advocacy, boundaries, and consent, particularly as it relates to students with disabilities. There is a content warning for today's presentation. Um, we are going to discuss what happens when students don't have a reliable way to communicate their consent as a way to then go through why it's so important that we really do focus intentionally on this practice in our work. This will unfortunately include a brief discussion of abuse um, because this information is critical to understanding this topic. I do recognize this is a sensitive subject. It's only going to be for the next two slides. If you do need to remove yourself or mute the presentation, you can go ahead and step out. Like I said, for the next two slides, we'll be talking about this, and then we'll be moving on to the practical framework. I want you to take a look at this number for a minute. This number paints the picture as to why this topic of consent and advocacies and boundaries really is a communication issue. This is data from a single study of abuse victims. 60% of those identified had a speech language impairment or a hearing impairment. It's, it's an undeniable fact that research shows that communication challenges increase the risk of abuse for children and students. It's why this is something that speech language pathologists need to be part of the team addressing alongside teachers, alongside families. We all need to be working on this. That's why I'm sitting here with you today having this conversation. Again, I'm not sharing these data for shock value, but to help you stop and think for a minute, that having a disability, particularly a disability that impacts your communication, really does have the potential to have a negative impact on the quality of life. These children are that much more likely to be taken advantage of by somebody, especially if we don't go through and give them to practice, to work on understanding their boundaries, communicating those boundaries, and a chance to feel successful communicating their boundaries, so that they're likely to do it again and again if these situations arise. Helping our students be able to effectively communicate their boundaries is one step towards increasing their safety and making sure that they don't become a part of these statistics. 
So here is where the research and the statistics start to come into play in our everyday practices. Children with disabilities may be unintentionally conditioned to comply with authority, which could result in them failing to recognize abusive behaviors as maltreatment. Read that again. I want you to really take a look at those words for a second and think about it, because this is what happens. Many of our standard practices that we use in our classrooms and our therapy sessions, things like video modeling, physical prompting, assistance with ADLs, these are all well-intentioned skills and tools used by professionals, but they might be being used without the consent of our students. Listen to that again. All of these things that we're doing in our regular daily practice, we do them without thinking. There's an evidence base behind them, but chances are we're doing them. We're touching our students' bodies, taking their likeness, their video, their picture without gaining their consent. These practices, they're not abusive and often necessarily depending on the individual's physical need, they might be necessary. But the problem arises when we condition our students that adults can come in, they can physically manipulate their bodies without asking first, particularly when our students are or our adults are in a position of authority or trust. Our students trust us. And so when we set the expectation that we can come in, we can move them around, we can take their picture, we can direct them where to go without checking in. They learn to understand that that's just the way things are. You see where I'm going here? These are all things that all of us have done. These are still things that I do on a regular basis because they're evidence-based practices. But just because we can engage in them doesn't mean that we should do so without our client's permission. That's the part we're going to work on changing today. Consent occurs at the intersection of our personal boundaries and our communication skills. We need to ensure that the children we are supporting have both when we talk about teaching them consent. So we need to make sure that our children understand their bodies have unique needs and that they have the ability to express those needs through their chosen communication modality. So neither one of these skills develops in a bubble um, and neither one of these skills develops comfortably without consistent practice. So if we put in the time to develop these skills, that's what we can do to ensure the children that we're supporting have a clear understanding of what it actually means to consent to participating in an interaction. So all of this starts with an understanding of our personal boundaries. Personal boundaries are defined as the limits or rules that we set for ourselves within our relationships. Sometimes these boundaries change based on the setting that we're in or just the general needs of an interaction. So these rules might be related to our physical space, such as asking a stranger not to hug you. Other times these boundaries are connected to our general well-being, such as asking your partner for a quiet 10 minutes when you get home because you've had a long day. Either way, the only person who gets to decide the boundary for yourself is you. And we owe our students that same opportunity. So in a classroom or a therapy setting, we often teach boundaries within social rules, such as not sitting on someone's lap at circle time, not pulling another student's hair to get their attention. However, we usually end the discussion there with those social cues rather than diving further into the topic and helping our students to understand their own boundaries and things that they might need for themselves. For example, a student with a touch sensitivity might not get like giving high fives at the door. A student with auditory sensitivity might prefer to wear headphones even during classroom instruction. Students who drink a large amount of water may need to use the bathroom more often than their peers, which means they're getting up throughout the day, throughout your class. At the end of the day, our students are the experts on their own bodies and our instruction needs to center them as those experts. Again, just the same way that you get to decide for yourself where your boundaries and limits are, we need to help our students feel comfortable, feel confident doing the same. The other piece here is self-advocacy. It doesn't matter how well our students understand their own personal boundaries if they don't have a way to clearly communicate them. And it doesn't matter how well our students clearly communicate those boundaries if the adults in their life aren't going to listen anyways. 
and it's true as adults we often tend to push past children's boundaries even if they've been clearly communicated now i'm not saying that they've been clearly communicated verbally but even if we're using our body language if we're using our behavior all of those things communicate something and a lot of times for our students those are being used to communicate their boundaries and we as adults push right past them. We tell a student that's wiggling in their seat that they can wait a minute to go to the bathroom because we're in the middle of something. We tell them as they're covering their ears, it's not too loud in the hallway, go keep walking with the rest of your class. We offer a student who's standing nervously next to the sink physical prompts and guidance so that they can wash their dirty hands even when it looks very clear like they don't want to touch the water. Now, I'm not saying any of this to judge anyone, because we've all been there, all of us as clinicians, as teachers, as parents, we've all done that. But when we stop and think about what it is we've done, we've pushed past the very boundaries that we are trying to encourage our students to advocate for. That means we need to recognize that it's even more important of teaching our students not only to advocate for their boundaries, but to stick with them and continue to advocate for them even an adult isn't listening. Let me say that again. Even if the adult isn't listening, because there's a really good chance that even unintentionally, we're pushing right past our boundaries, even as our students are communicating them. So in the field of speech pathology, there has been a shift towards teaching students to have self-advocacy goals rather than social skills goals, um, especially as autistic young adults have continued to share their experiences of traditional social skills, really encouraging them to mask when they were children rather than be their authentic self. And while it's great that as a field as a whole, we're really looking towards this idea of advocacy, we're increasing our focus on helping students to speak up for what their needs are, there needs to be just as much training for us, for the clinicians, the staff, the parents, the people in the students' lives on how to acknowledge and respond to those boundaries especially when maybe they might be a little uncomfortable for us. They might feel a little bit like the student is refusing or not complying with directions. We've heard those words in our classroom, right? We've written those words in our therapy reports. But again, if we're working on really teaching students for advocate for themselves to understand their boundaries and communicate those needs because we know that it's going to keep them safe, we need to be able to move past our own discomfort, look at our place in this system, look at what it is that we're doing to our students to make sure that they really are learning to use this skill effectively. All right, so as I said before, consent occurs at the intersection between our personal boundaries and our self-advocacy skills. In order to truly consent to an interaction, we have to have an understanding of our own bodies and our own needs and we have to have a way to clearly communicate those boundaries and those needs and the confidence to keep communicating those boundaries and those needs, even when somebody might be trying to push past them for their own agenda. So we need to make sure that we have both of these things in place before we work on actually explicitly teaching consent. So once our students are able to combine that understanding of their own boundaries with a means to effectively advocate, they're able to fully consent to interactions. So this I've broken down the dictionary definition of consent, and it's probably one that you're familiar with in the context of a sex education class, because let's be honest, for many individuals, if they receive any direct instruction in the idea of consent, it's related to personal boundaries within a sexual education setting. But physical boundaries are a part of our everyday life, and we need to be comfortable treating them as such. If we wanna make it simple, consent is a life skill. Many of our daily interactions include thinking about and receiving consent. We're just not used to framing it in those terms. So when you break it down, consent is agreement or permission that has been mutually understood. It's related to a specific activity and you can remove it at any time. So consent means that somebody agrees to, says, yes, you can, in a way that is mutually understood. That means they understand what they're saying 
and their partner is able to understand that same message. There's no confusion, no room for miscommunication. It's related to a specific activity and you can take it back at any time. If you started the activity and you've decided that you don't like it, you're able to stop that. You're able to say, nope, this actually isn't for me. That's what consent is. That's what we need to work on teaching in the framework of not just a sex education class, but in all of our day-to-day -day interactions. Let me give you an example. We think about washing hands. So if we're gonna help a student to wash their hands, say they've gotten glue all over them from an art project. So we need to make sure that we have their agreement, their permission. Hey, looks like you've got glue on your fingers. Can I help you wash your hands? We need to make sure that we both understand the student's response. They nod their head. It's a pretty good indicator of yes, right? We need to make sure that's specific to the activity. So if I said, I'm gonna help you wash your hands, that doesn't mean while we're there at the sink, I'm also gonna start brushing your teeth or suggesting that you wash your face. They didn't agree to that activity. They agreed to washing their hands. And it's removable at any time. If we get their hands under the sink, they decide that the soap smells or the water is too hot, or suddenly they like that feeling of glue on their fingers and they're not ready to have it go away yet. They can stop the interaction. Our student can say, nope, don't want to. They can start shaking their head. They can pull away from the sink. They have made it clear they're removing their consent. We need to stop that interaction and see what we're going to do again. You see how that can be like a regular everyday interaction. We've all helped students wash their hands after a messy activity. And we're just not used to thinking about when they nod and say, yes, sure, go ahead and help me, that they've actually consented to that interaction. We're just not used to using that word in these everyday contexts. But for our students that need the chance to consistently practice the skill, for our students that need the chance to learn their boundaries and understand sort of their own personal feelings and be able to practice that communication, we're really all of these everyday interactions. These are the places we need to practice these skills, build up their confidence, help them feel success so that they'll continue to advocate for those boundaries, continue to give or remove their consent when they move into situations that might be a little bit more challenging or uncomfortable than simply washing their hands. So here's where we start to move into the practical application. So if we've all gotten on the same page that we're working with students to really understand and communicate their boundaries, and that means we as adults also need to be consistent in how we respect and respond to those boundaries when our students are expressing them. Again, the more we teach our students to set boundaries and then we push past them anyways, the more we're making it clear to them that there really is no point in advocating because nobody is listening. So in this case, I use the framework alter as a reminder that we really want to alter or change our role in the interaction to ensure that our students' needs and boundaries are respected. So the goal here is to move our students away from the expectation that we as adults can direct their bodies or their actions simply because we're adults. Instead, we want to help them communicate their own level of comfort with a given situation. And we wanna teach them that those boundaries should be respective. That means as adults, we have to give them those repeated opportunities to decide and communicate what a healthy boundary feels like for them. So the reason we use the word alter for this framework is because we as adults are altering our role in this interaction. We're not just coming in and saying, here's how it is and expecting them to follow through. This really is requiring work on our part to be active listeners, active participants, in the interaction to make sure we're really setting our students up to be successful in understanding and communicating these boundaries and being able to agree to what it is they're participating in. So ALTER is based on four main principles. First thing we do is we ask for permission, we listen and observe to what the student's responses are, we talk through our own responses so our students can see where we're coming from, and then we ultimately, we work together to find a way to respect that boundary. Okay, so I don't know about you, but I know personally, I learn best when I have a concrete example. So that's what we're going to go through here. So you have a blank copy of the ALTER framework in your handbook, the handouts that were given to you. Um, but either way, we're gonna walk through each step one letter at a time using this specific example to kind of go through and see how we could change that interaction. 
So here's the situation. I'm in a co-treatment session with the OT. The student and I were all in the sensory gym together. The session is over. We asked the student to put their shoes on to go back to class. So a student puts their shoes on, sits on the bench, starts kind of kicking their feet because they don't have the motor skills yet to tie them by themselves. OT asks, can we help you tie your shoes? Student nods. So OT and I step forward. We're each going to take one shoe, tie them quickly, help the student get back to class so we can move on with our day. As soon as I touched that student's foot, they kicked their legs and started screaming, bloody murder. So did I have the student's consent to help them with their shoes? They nodded yes when we asked, but remember, consent can be revoked at any time. And this student was making it clear in the moment that they did not want either one of us touching their feet. But they needed their shoes tied to get back to class. There's a flight of stairs down from our OT gym. And if they walked down the stairs with their shoes untied, most likely they would have tripped and fallen. If we let them go, there's an excellent chance they could have gotten hurt. So what should we do? So the first step is to ask for permission. This is a really good habit to get into anytime you're going to be helping a student with something that requires you to physically enter their space or physically manipulate part of their body. That includes things like wheelchairs or communication devices. Those are extensions of our students that are a part of them. And we really need to be in the habit of asking before we go in and touch their personal bodies. So when we ask for permission, we want to establish the, pur the purpose of the interaction. Why am I coming in? Why am I going to touch you or help you? And then communicate exactly what it is that the student can expect from you. So in this case, the OT established the purpose of the interaction. She said, hey, can we help you tie your shoes? And from us, we've tied shoes before for the student. This wasn't a new thing. So we assumed that they understood that they knew what to expect from that interaction. So we went ahead and moved on to starting to help them tie their shoes. So next we have our L, our listen and observe. In this case, we listened to the student's initial response. When we asked them, can we help you tie your shoes? They nodded their head yes. They were already sitting on the bench. And for this student, this happened to be a routine activity. They, they don't know how to tie their shoes. So every time we leave the OT gym, somebody helps them get their shoes back on their feet. This wasn't a totally foreign experience for them. So again, when we got that head nod, we assumed that what they were saying was, yes, you can go ahead and help me. But when we observed their body language, as soon as we moved in to help them, we observed that change in their body, right? We saw them start kicking their feet. We heard them start screaming. So even though we'd gotten an initial confirmation and initial yes to helping them, what we could see with their body didn't match that response and made it very clear that they actually, in that moment, did not want us helping them tying their shoes, did not want us touching that part of their body. All right, this is where we move on to the T of the framework, talking through our responses. We wanna talk through our response. We wanna acknowledge what the student is communicating. That includes any verbal responses or AAC responses they may have given us initially, as well as any other changes in their nonverbal communication that they may have added once we actually started the interaction. When we acknowledge our response and we talk through it, we wanna make sure that we're clarifying the purpose of the interaction so the student sees what it was we were trying to do. We also wanna make sure that we're expressing empathy and understanding for their situation. Our student is working hard to communicate a boundary. They're working hard to advocate for themselves. And since that's our final goal, we want to make sure that we recognize that for them, that we show them we are understanding and we are listening before we continue to work through and see what we can do in the situation. So for this student, their boundary had been clearly set, right? They did not want us touching their feet in that moment. That doesn't change the reality that they can't safely leave the OT gym and go down that flight of stairs with their shoes untied. They also can't stay in the OT gym because we both have other sessions to get to. So the OT and I, we acknowledge their boundary. And we gave them a minute before asking again with more information. Okay, so you don't want me to touch your feet right now. I can see that. I need to be able to tie your shoes so you can go back to class. To tie your shoes, I need to touch your feet. Can I touch your feet to help with your shoes? That's, that's all there is to it. You see that simple rephrasing there. I'm acknowledging what they showed me. I'm explaining the situation, why I need to be able to touch them, which might be going against that boundary that they're trying to set. And then I'm giving that power back to them to either stick to their boundary 
or maybe in light of the new information, change their response. The final step of the framework, the R, is respecting their boundary. And this can be the hardest one. This is the one that takes the most work on the part of the adults to do. Once a student has set a boundary, we need to, within reason, acknowledge and respect it. So if we, there's situations going on, we can clarify our offer, we can provide an alternate solution, but ultimately, if our goal is to teach our students to be good self-advocates, we need to be able to respect the boundary that they've set, unless there's an immediate danger, and we'll get to that in just a minute. But in this case, there's, there's no immediate danger to having your shoes untied, right? So for this student, we didn't get their shoes tied that day. Instead, they took them off and they walked back to class in just their socks. There was no reason that they couldn't do that. That was a perfectly safe alternative that didn't involve us having to touch their feet, which was totally against what they wanted for that day. So here's what happened in this situation with that same student. The next time we went to help them, they had a much quieter protest. The next time we did that again, we got one shoe tied before they asked us to go ahead and stop. So the OT and I had showed the student that we were respectful of their boundaries and we weren't going to force them to do something that was uncomfortable. By the end of the year, really within a couple of months, we'd gained their trust to the point where the OT could actually work with them on trying to tie their shoes. But we let the students set the pace of that interaction, set the pace of that learning based on their own comfort level. They were that much more receptive to our help and support because they knew we weren't going to push them past something that they were comfortable letting us do. So like I said, the goal of the ALTER framework is to help us build that trust with our students, that they trust that they can communicate their boundaries, that they can explore their boundaries with us and trust that we aren't going to push them past their comfort level. But with any framework, there are going to be limitations. And in this case, danger or emergency situations is one of them. Obviously, as the adults in the situation, safety is always going to be our priority. If our student is harming themselves or others, or if there's an ongoing emergency, we might have to push past the boundaries that they're communicating in order to keep them safe. But the goal of using this framework of centering consent in the first place is that we're working to build trust with our students. And then we can use another framework to move back and process in these situations when we've had to push past their boundaries. And we should make the point of doing that practice with our students so that we continue to build and establish that trust for them. Like I said, safety first is always going to be our job. That's our responsibility as the adult in the situation, right? And sometimes we have to push past our students' boundaries to keep them safe. We have to stop them from running into a parking lot at dismissal, even though they're so excited to see their parents' car. We have to help them leave behind their toys and exit the building when the fire alarm goes off. We have to stop them from hitting a peer when they're feeling frustrated with the situation. So I'm not suggesting that we ignore these or any sort of similar scenarios in the case of helping our students learn and advocate for their boundaries. But when these situations do happen, when we have to go against the consent that we're practicing teaching, it's important that we make sure we talk through our students about why we're pushing past their boundaries in the specific moment. So in this case, I use another acronym, CARE, to remind us that caring really is at the core of what we want to do. So this is a framework similar to ALTER that's helping you as the adult process with your student what went wrong, why it happened, and what can be changed for future situations. So when we process through a situation with care, we're looking to make sure that we communicate our reasoning, that we acknowledge the student's feelings, we respond to their specific concerns they might have, and then together we can evaluate and plan what it is we can change moving forward. So let's look through again, another specific example of how you can put care into action. So to work through the care framework, let's use the example of a student refusing to leave the classroom when there's a fire alarm going off. Remember that this is the framework we use when we have to clearly violate a student's boundary that they've communicated due to safety concerns. So in this case, you've got the student sitting on the floor, refusing to get up, and you have to pick them up and physically move them out of your classroom, even though they might be screaming or crying. So the first step to repair this violation of their boundary is to communicate your reasoning. 
So you don't do this in the moment. You wait until after the situation has passed, until everybody has calmed down from all of their big feelings, but you do wanna do it soon enough that your student can still understand and make the connection to the situation. This isn't something that you go ahead and do like a week later, but you might wait an hour or two after the event before you go through and try to repair that relationship. So again, the first step is to communicate your reasoning. In this case, explain what the student was doing and why you had to intervene. So you were sitting on the floor crying, not getting up to walk out of the class. I had to pick you up and carry you because we can't stay in the classroom when the fire alarm is going off. We have to walk outside with the rest of our class and wait for the firefighters in case it's an emergency. That's it. No judgment, no additional comments, just very clearly black and white facts of what happened and why you reacted the way you did. The next step is to acknowledge the student's feelings in the situation. Again, we want to do this by expressing empathy and concern and also giving language to any nonverbal or behavioral communication that we might have observed. Again, we're doing this without judgment. We're not forcing the students to give us any sort of response or acknowledgement. We want to make it clear to them, though, that we were listening and we did see what was happening, even if we had to put them in a situation that made them somewhat uncomfortable. So in this situation with the fire alarm, you might say, I saw you sitting on the floor. You were covering your ears. I bet you were probably scared that alarm was really loud. And I'm sorry that I had to pick you up and bring you out where the alarm was even louder. The next step is our R, where we respond to their concerns. So again, the job here, we're trying to repair our relationships. We want to make it clear that we did hear their boundary. We want to make sure that we give clear and specific meaning to our own interactions in that situation and why it was that we had to push them past their boundary. So again, this sounds a little bit like reiterating what we said, but we're using this as a teaching opportunity. We want to make sure that our students continue to feel comfortable advocating in the future. So we really do want to make sure that we are taking responsibility and clarifying why we took the actions that we took in this uncomfortable situation. So back to our example with a fire alarm, making it clear, I saw you sitting on the floor. I know you didn't want to get up and walk out with your class. I had to pick you up because you weren't moving on your own and we can't stay in the building when the fire alarm goes off. It's not safe. It might have been an emergency. That's it. Again, not offering any judgment, not making any like complaints or targeted attacks towards the student that they weren't listening, they weren't following directions. We're really reflecting on our own actions and our own role in the situation while giving the student the chance to sort of build an understanding of why we reacted the way we did. We're not pushing our student to sort of reflect on or change their own interactions yet. We really want to make sure that we saw and we understood and we acknowledged them and then make it clear to them that maybe we didn't want to not listen, but we had to in this case for a very specific reason. The last step of this framework is the E, evaluate and plan what you can change. This is where we start to do some of that processing and looking towards the future. So in this case, we might offer the students alternate solutions that they can pick through, or we might offer or think about the additional education that they might need to help really increase their understanding of the situation. You know, in this specific case, it might have been the first time that this student heard a fire alarm go off or had the ability to experience a fire drill at school. So maybe we need to make sure that as a classroom we're practicing or we're offering a social story or we're giving them a chance to go listen to some fire alarms on YouTube so they get used to what the sound is, right? Those are all additional opportunities we can give them to better understand the situation so that we can make a plan for how to be more safe in the future. This is really an interactive step that you have to do with your student. And again, you'll adjust it based on your students' needs and their level, but you really do want to make sure that you're involving them in whatever plan it is that you make because you guys want to work together to make sure that moving forward, when a similar situation happens, you maybe don't have to push past their boundary quite so far and so that they understand here in this case that even though you did push past their boundary, you really do want to work with them to make sure that you're not repeating that action again in the future. Again, this is a framework that's used for repair, right? We've already done something that was uncomfortable. So we really want to make sure that we're all on the same page here to make sure that we can avoid doing that uncomfortable thing, that pushing past the boundary again in the future. 
Okay, so now is the time where we're going to go through the case study portion of this. And I want you to think about how we use, I use alter to kind of move through this interaction. So in your workbook, there is a blank copy of the alter framework. As I talk through this situation, I want you to kind of make note of how I move myself through the framework when interacting with the student, make note of anything that you might do differently. Again, since I'm not there presenting with you live today, we can't discuss it as a general discussion. Um, but I do encourage you to, once we kind of get through the end of the situation, to pause, talk amongst it as yourselves as a group. And I will give you my contact information at the end so you can reach out if you have specific questions about this situation. Okay, so here is the situation that I want you to think about. I've got a kindergarten student on my case load this year. This student has a great family support, great outside therapist. They came into our kindergarten classroom with an established AAC device and some pretty strong communication skills. The student had also never been in a school setting before. Uh, they didn't understand classroom routines, how to participate in the expectations of a school day. So the first few times I get, get them for speech, they followed me happily, right? They wanted to explore the building. They wanted to check out the toys in my room, all the great stuff. Like it was beautiful, fabulous sessions, exactly like you picture. Then they started to get settled into their classroom routine. They started to connect more with their peers. They started to really follow along with the flow of the day that their teacher had established. Suddenly they didn't want to come to speech anymore. In fact, one day I went to go get them from their speech room. They saw me in the doorway, ran to the sensory corner of their classroom. And that was it. They made it very clear. I mean, I can see when a student run away from me, they're not really wanting to interact with me right now, right? So I kind of come in, I give it a minute before I even approach them. I go over, I check in with their one-on-one. -on -one. I see what the teacher, what the rest of the class is gonna be working on right now. I pick up that student's visual schedule from their table area, and then I kind of made my way over to them. So as soon as I started to approach their little corner, they took their weighted blanket, pulled it farther over their head and turned their back on me. Again, very clear nonverbal communication, right? They wanted nothing to do with me in this moment. So again, I haven't said anything yet. I just kind of sat on the floor next to them. And then I showed them on their schedule, hey, it's time for speech. Like, I'm ready. Are you ready? I asked them if they wanted one more minute. I asked them if they wanted to come with me now. They kind of pulled up their device and they said, go, goodbye. When I didn't immediately jump up off the floor and start moving towards the door, they got up, walked towards the doorway, pointed to the symbol that we have on the door that said open, repeated goodbye, added a wave to make sure that I was very, very clear there was no missing it. They wanted me gone from the room, and that was that. Now, as a clinician, I'm not generally in the practice of letting my kindergartners refuse to come to sessions, right? Um, but they made it very clear there that they weren't going to be coming with me out of the room right now. So I sat back down for a minute, waited for them to kind of move back into the space by their table. Once they were there and they had started pulling out the letters for that, what the teacher was doing for like a whole classroom literacy activity, I just kind of again sat back into their area and said, it's time for speech so you can come with me or I can stay in the classroom and help you do your letters student totally pretended that they hadn't heard a word I said. They're laser focused on their teacher. I've never seen them so focused in their life, right? So again, I'm just sitting there, haven't pushed anything yet, but I just sort of slide a couple of the letters over to me like I'm looking at them and I'm just listening along to what the teacher is doing. They're listening to the teacher. She's asking them to find the letter A on their table. It's one of the ones in front of me. The student looks over at me, looks back to what the teacher's showing them to do on the board, kind of grabs their device and says, hello, help, A. So that took a whole probably 10 minutes before they even greeted me, made it clear that maybe I could start to be part of that interaction by giving me that hello, that acknowledgement that, okay, you're in my space, you're part of my space. And then further requesting help and the letter that I had so that they could participate with the activity. Now, is that what we plan to do for speech today? Absolutely not. But I was okay recognizing that where the student needed to be that day in that moment 
was in the classroom with their peers and their teacher. They wanted to be a part of that activity. And ultimately, that's my goal as a clinician is to make sure that they're successful in that setting. So while it hadn't been what I planned to work on, and certainly, you know, not what I expected when I walked into the room, I was more than thrilled with the, what the fact that they had communicated that boundary so clearly, but that they were also sort of willing to work with me on finding a way where I could still be a part of that interaction, be a part of that learning process, instead of just completely banishing me from the classroom. So I want you now to kind of think through that whole alter framework. So how did I go through each of those individual steps with this interaction? Right, so how did I ask my student for their permission? How did I ask them to join me in the interaction? What did I listen to? What did I observe them doing that made it clear the boundary that they were communicating? It made it clear that they really didn't want me in the session, <laughs> in the classroom or leaving with me for the session. How did I talk through my response? How did I talk through sort of what my expectations were, what I saw from them, how did I offer some opportunities that we could maybe work towards meeting in the middle a little bit? Ultimately, did I respect their boundary to not leave the classroom? Did I still respect my own needs to be able to pull them and have some speech therapy time while respecting the boundary that they set that they wanted to participate in the classroom instruction? So I want you to think through that for a minute. See if there's anything specific that stood out to you that I did that you're, you're thinking fits totally within the framework. If there's anything you think I did that went against the framework, again, this is a framework, a basis for practice. We are still all human clinicians and teachers and parents, right? There is no, no perfect framework, no perfect way to work through something. Maybe you have an idea of how we can go through and do this a little bit differently. I would love for you to go through and share that with each other now. So I want you to go ahead and pause this. Go ahead and talk through as a group if there's anything that comes up. Um, and then once you finish that conversation, you can go ahead and resume the presentation. All right, I do want to apologize again for not being able to be there live with you today to participate in that conversation, but I hope that you were able to reflect on the alter framework within that case study, um, see some good examples from what I did, and maybe go through anything that you think I could have improved on or things that you would have improved or changed for your own set of circumstances in your caseload or in your classroom or in your home. Um, I want to leave you with this one final quote. So this is a student from a project called Rooted in Rights. Um, this is Daisy. She's a teenager sharing her own experiences with consent. So she says, it's the reality for many kids with disabilities that we grow to expect being touched without being able to talk about boundaries, comfort, or safety. So this right here, this is the basis for the ALTER framework, for us as adults to recognize and change these actions within ourselves. It's also the reason we talk through the CARE framework as a way to process and challenge when we have to reestablish trust when these boundaries are violated, whether intentionally or not. Again, the work here is not just for our students. We need to give them, yes, the language and the tools they need to be good self-advocates, but then we also need to reflect on our own behavior and practices to make sure that we are respecting the boundaries that we've taught them to communicate. So I want to go ahead and leave you with a couple of resources. So the first, these are all of the research articles that I referenced through different points. Um, they're all able to, uh, available to be found online, or you can email me. I do have PDF copies of most of them available to share as well couple of online resources. So there is a collection of non-journal based articles that are some really good parent or student perspectives that you can find here. Um, and then that video interview I did talk about from the Rooted with Rights organization. I recommend watching the whole video. I know I only shared a single quote from it, but the whole perspective really is a great video to watch and you can watch that here. And then the last thing I want to say is learning doesn't happen all at once. That's sort of, again, why this is a framework, why this is a tool, and why we're talking about this is it's going to take consistent practice to change these behaviors within ourselves and to really be the advocates that our students need as they learn to advocate and practice these skills on their own. So that being said too, I'm not expecting that you got all of your questions answered here today because you're gonna go through, you're gonna process this, you're gonna put things into practice, and then you're gonna come back with more questions or want more feedback. 
Um, so I do have, I'm, my inbox is always open. I'm happy to talk with people. So you can find me on the internet, coffeedogsandspeech.com. It's also my email address, coffeedogsandspeech at gmail.com. Social media is more your thing. You can find me on Instagram. I do all of my messages there at Coffee Dogs and Speech. Um, and I do have a couple of training videos up on my YouTube channel as well. It goes through a few of these practices in a little bit more depth. That's Coffee Dogs and Speech as well. I like to keep things consistent. Um, again, I want to thank you so much for your time sitting to listen with me today. And please do not hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. I really, this is such an important topic that I really do want to open and continue the conversation with you to really help you be able to serve your students better. So thank you so much for your time. I hope you all have a wonderful day.